The most numerous self-propelled types to mount the SIG 33 were those that employed the Panzer 38T chassis. Both models produced were known as the Bison. The first emerged in February 1943 and used the tank chassis with the gun mounted forward inside a box-like superstructure. As these weapons were required for service in the forthcoming summer campaign, the first 90 of the type seen here were converted using Panzer 38T Model H's returned from the front and then issued to heavy infantry gun companies of Panzer Grenadier divisions. The Bison saw widespread service in 1943 and was employed in Tunisia, France and Russia. The example seen here belonging to the Waffen-SS was employed in the Battle of Kursk in July. Small numbers were also encountered in Normandy in 1944. Seen in Milan in August 1943, where it was sent for security duties after its mauling at Kursk, is this rarely filmed 38T Bison belonging to the 1st SS Panzer Grenadier Division, Leibstandarte Adolf Hitler. It passes a late Marder III belonging to the Panzer Jager Battalion of the division. 282 of the final model of the Bison saw the SIG 33 mounted on the identical 38T chassis as used for the late model Marder III tank hunter. The SIG 33 was also employed in 1941 to produce a powerful, fully armoured infantry assault gun on the Panzer III E and F8 chassis. Series production was not undertaken, just 24 being produced. And these served at Stalingrad in 1942 with the survivors operating in the Kuban bridgehead in southern Russia. Making its debut with the 216th Sturmpanzer Abteilung at the Battle of Kursk in July 1943 were 60 Sturmpanzer IV Brumbars. This machine had been designed as a heavy armoured assault vehicle and had found particular favour with Hitler, who'd ordered its production in October 1942. The SIG 33 was ball mounted in a very heavy armoured box with 100 millimetres of armour to the front and 50 millimetres on the side. The first version lacked a forward firing machine gun and the driver's vision slit was mounted low down on the front superstructure face. The mid-production Brumbar could be distinguished by the periscope mounted on the driver's housing. A fleeting glimpse of a late model Brumbar can be caught behind the vehicle's crew as they line up to be presented with decorations for their bravery whilst engaged in heavy fighting with British forces on the border with Holland. The armoured superstructure of the Brumbar offered comparatively greater protection and space for its five-man crew than did the hull and turret of a standard Panzer IV. In addition, the late model Brumbar had been substantially reworked to incorporate significant improvements to the design. The omission of a machine gun for close-in defence was rectified by fitting a ball mount high on the left side of the front superstructure plate. Armoured configuration on the front plate was also improved. The calibre of the standard heavy artillery piece of the German army throughout the war was 150 millimetres. These weapons were employed in a number of different versions. While the bulk of this heavy artillery was horse-drawn, those 150mm FH-18s attached to panzer divisions were towed. Each panzer division had three battalions of artillery, one heavy, each with three batteries of four guns towed by an eight-ton half-track. While the speed with which half-tracks could bring the heavy weapons up to the front line was impressive, compared to the ponderous horse artillery, the setting up of the piece to fire on its designated target might take up to half an hour. The performance of the weapon itself, however, was satisfactory, the FH-18 being able to fire a shell of 43.5 kilograms out to 13,000 metres. What the mobile formations desired was a fully tracked vehicle that could mount a 150mm gun and be available for employment on demand. They had to wait until 1943. The prototype of the Hummel self-propelled gun mounted a 150mm howitzer with a large muzzle brake on a Panzer III IV chassis. It appeared in 1942 when the decision was taken to commit it to production. Hummels first saw action during Operation Citadel in July 43. these being operated by the Heavy Artillery Battalion of the SS Panzer Grenadier Division Totenkopf. Early Hummels can be recognised by the driver's compartment which stood proud of the sloping front plate. 
In the later model, this compartment was extended across the whole front of the vehicle. When not in use, the 150mm howitzer was locked in place by the large bracket mounted on the glasses plate. The Hummel shared the open-top superstructure made of thin armour plating found on all German self-propelled guns at this time. This was less problematic for the crew in as much as they opened fire some distance away from the main fighting and were not so vulnerable as the crews of Panzerjager. Initial allotment of Hummels was limited, just six being allocated to receiving Panzer divisions together with a number of the ammunition carrying variants to help resupply the self-propelled guns in the field. These were necessary vehicles as the Hummel only carried 18 rounds of 150 mil ammunition on board and these were often rapidly expended once a barrage began. The availability of the Hummel gave the Panzer divisions the heavy punch to hit the Soviet forces whenever they were required to launch a counter-attack to contest a new breakthrough. Although the Hummel was always regarded as interim solution, pending development of a purpose-designed SP gun, these were never enough to satisfy demand. Often Hummels were seen to be firing alongside the smaller Vespa self-propelled guns as seen here in Hungary in early 1945 while fighting around Budapest. It was perhaps symptomatic of the waning strength of German military power that when Dr. Goebbels chose to make a last visit to the Oder front in March 1945, he was taken to watch the firing of a solitary Hummel. This vehicle had proved itself to be an extremely effective weapon and by the time production ended in 1944, 666 gun vehicles and 150 resupply vehicles had been constructed by Alket and Deutsche Eisenwerk. The German army entered the Second World War in possession of a range of unique and highly effective light anti-aircraft guns that were to be employed throughout the conflict with great success. The light 20mm Flak 30 emerged in the 1930s and was already in widespread service when this film about the Luftwaffe was put out by the Air Ministry. Drawn by crook boxers, the light flak guns are driven to their fire positions. The gun is then unhitched and slid off its carrying chassis onto its base and made ready for firing. The soldier wearing the rangefinder calls out the distance as two Dornier DO-23s lumber overhead. The flat gun is speedily turned on its axis to follow the planes round by the crew as the gunner lets fly at the targets. Six years later, the same procedure is followed as the flak fires on Allied aircraft over the Straits of Messina. As a crewman stands watch on a flak veiling in Russia, another opens fire on Allied warplanes over southern Italy. It is joined by a 37mm flak and single 20mm flak, the three weapons employed on the most German self-propelled flak vehicles until 1945 and used in action from the Arctic Ocean to the Aegean from the Bay of Biscay to the Black Sea. The DMAG one-ton half-track was the first vehicle to be employed for the purpose of mounting a flak gun. Initially the type was armed with a 20mm flak 30 cannon, but this was later superseded by the flak 38. Although ostensibly designed for the purpose of protecting military formations from air attack, this variant was employed as much in a ground support role. The 20mm cannon was ideally suited for shooting up ground targets, being supplied with armour piercing as well as high explosive ammunition. In the opening phases of the Russian campaign, it was discovered that the flak could be used to penetrate the thin armour of the very numerous and obsolescent Soviet light tanks. Although ammunition was carried in six small bins attached to the drop sides of the flatbed on which the gun was mounted, most DMAGs carried a further and larger supply in a two-wheeled trailer. A total number of seven crewmen were required to drive the half-track and operate the flat gun. The principal disadvantage of this type was that the crew were totally exposed to enemy fire, steps to give the vehicle a modicum of armour protection not being taken until late in the production run an armoured cab being provided for the driver and a shield for the flat gun. Other than this modification, the DMAG remained otherwise unchanged, being produced by a variety of industrial concerns until production was halted in 1944, by which time 610 had been produced. 
It was to serve in all theatres and saw action until the end of the war. The Flak Panzer 38T was a makeshift machine put into production to bolster numbers of mobile Flak, pending availability of more sophisticated Flak Panzers. With Luftwaffe air superiority long since vanished from the skies above the battlefields in east and west, the army needed every Flak vehicle it could muster. The German army had a propensity for arming every chassis that could mount a worthwhile weapon. Standard lorries like the Opel Blitz and Horch heavy passenger car were modified to carry the 20mm flak, most being employed in the ground support role. Such was the versatility of the Krauss Maffei built 8 ton half track that 319 were employed to mount the 20mm flak veerling, with production continuing until 1944. To accommodate the weapon, all the seating and ammunition stowage lockers of the artillery prime mover were removed and replaced with a flatbed with dropped sides. The flak veerling was mounted on the flatbed. Ten crew were needed to both drive and service the weapon and the ammunition was normally carried in a trailer. The need for some degree of protection for the driver was recognised in 1943 when an armoured cab was fitted. An example of this later type is seen in Budapest in early 44. One of the more graphic sequences of film showing the flak veiling and eight-ton half-track in action was taken during the Operation Market Garden, the abortive Allied attempt to seize and hold the bridges over the River Rhine at Arnhem in September 1944. A cameraman was on hand to record an SS flak veiling being employed to shoot up the descending British paratroopers and the aircraft bringing them from England. Later supply flights by Stirling Transports paid dearly as the flak was able to take advantage of their need to fly low over the drop zones. Many were lost. Armoured lorries also mounted the flak veiling. This example is seen in Italy in 1944. 